dude. He just ran him over. Oh my God. Yo, cover him, cover him. Take it, take it. We need, we need repair, repair. Lock it, lock it, lock it. Got it. I got the ISP. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> no. Did you just murder him? I don't know. <laughs> With a few days of war under our belt, the Royal Spuds were shaping up to be a proper regiment. We were still very new, but in what was historically one of the toughest regions to fight in against some of the most experienced opponents, we had now helped secure two relic bases and an observation tower in the name of the Wardens. In order to win the war, factions have to capture specific town halls all over the map. These can be found by looking for the victory condition labels on towns, and although we hadn't captured any of these just yet, by pushing the Colonials out of Godcrofts, we were not only protecting Axehead, the victory town in our region, but also putting pressure on Liar's Haven in Tempest. This isn't to say we were anywhere close to capturing much more in Tempest, but it was still good to have ground in the next region. After slugging it out over a tiny, hilly, and bottlenecked region for days now, we felt as if our current defensive setup on Planifada, Lost Arkle, and Fort Spud was at least sufficient enough to hold out so that we could assist our allies elsewhere. With that, we set our sights on Endless Shore direct west of us and home to Saltbrook Channel, a cramped and highly urbanized town compared to the rural area that we were familiar with in Godcrofts. Although starting as a contested region, meaning any team could claim it at the start of War 83, the Wardens had secured Saltbrook Channel and pushed south across the river. With the nearby relic of Old Jack Tar being liberated the day before, we seemed to be on the front foot in this region. But just as soon as we captured it, the Colonials fought back, storming through Old Jack Tar and then getting right up to the city gates of Saltbrook Channel. The Spuds deployed to reinforce, but we soon found out that not only were we close to being broken on the west, but the entire city as a whole was scrambling to defend in every direction. It was an incredible sight to see, chaos in the center of the city as soldiers scrambled to keep the enemy out, while countless construction and logistics vehicles moved to rebuild and resupply all around us. Saltbrook was completely different to anything we had seen in Godcrofts, and it was critical to hold in the region since not only did it have a town hall, but it also had a garage to build and repair vehicles and two factories to create frontline materials. With salvage yards to the north and a refinery nearby in Foxcatcher, our logistics network could gather enough resources just outside of the city, run up to Foxcatcher to refine them, and then drive back down to Saltbrook to toss it into the factory and make exactly what was needed right where it needed to be. To put it into comparison to what we were dealing with in the east, our logistics had to salvage in Morgan's Crossing, refine and then build everything in all site, only to finally make the long drive south to the front. This was a completely different type of logistics network, and because of that, the importance of the fight was really just right in your face. Allow the enemy to break through, and that factory that you were using to build weapons and medical supplies, well, it's no longer there, and you can physically see it fall apart. Losing that could quickly domino into losing the entire southern part of the city, with us being forced to retreat back north across the bridge. This entire fight was nerve-wracking, and I think everyone around us felt that. With all this industry, the intense close quarters fighting, and the tendency to snow, which it was right now, Saltbrook Channel had been aptly named Saltingrad in comparisons with the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II, and if I'm gonna be honest, I think it really lived up to it. Bounding from house to house, we would soon find out that urban combat is a lot faster paced than what we were dealing with back home. At times, enemy were literally on the other side of the wall next to us, seemingly within arm's reach, but the amount of incoming and outgoing fire would prevent either side from moving an inch. Dude, this is actually insane! Oh, got him! Got him! Backblast kill? I can just pop this guy with an RPG. Oh! oh. On this side. Thank you. Oh. What? How did I die? Medic! They don't let me die out here! Thank you, Valen. My man. 
credit. Oh no! Oh, I had it, dude. Oh my God, I had it. Can we claim it? Do you have a wrench? No, cover him, cover him. Take it, take it. We need, we need repair, repair. Lock it, lock it, lock it. it, it it's all right, all right. Let's just rep it. We need to repair it. Do we have reps? Ah, uh, they destroyed it. Damn, it's alright. the nade I'm so sorry <laughs> oh I'm, I'm sorry oh I'm sorry Let, let's let's blame the person who didn't realize that cooking a nade makes me unable to straighten my knees Block by block, we would clear corners and secure buildings, only to have enemy infantry storm in and take out a few of us at a time. When possible, sandbag lines would form in order to give us a small chance to hold the area. As we poured out suppressing fire and grenades, cranes would follow behind us and drop in placements, allowing us an even better chance to fight off the storm of colonials crashing through the gates. Focus on one side too long, and all of a sudden, we'd see an enemy poking the gap in our lines, and seconds later, a multiple would pour through, cutting us off from the front. Since we had lost Old Jack Tar the night before, a lot of effort was being put on the western side of the city, but the south was also falling. By now, quite a few of the spuds had made it to Saltbrook, so instead of continuing the bloody grind at the city gates out west, we took it upon ourselves to fortify the southern entrance to the city, and it was soon covered with sandbags, barbed wire, and an emplaced anti-infantry flak gun. It was the best we could do to keep them out, and with the high ground now secured, the enemy could do nothing but run headfirst at the walls in hopes to overwhelm us with grenades. It was working. Our defense were finally blocking the collies from breaking in and taking pot shots at the nearby factories. All was going well, and then night fell. The snowstorm and increasing darkness severely reduced our visibility, allowing the enemy to periodically pop up in a spot we had just cleared. In order to improve our defensive line, we started to extend the sandbags a little bit out of the city walls to allow for spotters to try and catch people running across the street towards us. That, plus some flares from a nearby mortar house, allowed us to regain control of the area. I'm not gonna lie, the darkness in this game is actually really unsettling. It gave us a real sensation of being on a fragile front line. Since we were able to push out so far, I think we also took the enemy by surprise sometimes overnight as well, since now we had poked out just enough that we could actually begin intercepting anything that passed along the road. The royal spuds were holding well, and as I ran back to rearm and check supplies, I heard a French accent frantically yelling about needing a gunner. About an hour earlier, I'd seen my first tank yet a small open top tank that fired a 12.7 millimeter machine gun. This was a significant turning point in the war, since until now we've been restricted to purely infantry combat. Now, not only did the Colonials have a tankette, we had an armored car. And this armored car was owned by 2nd Lieutenant Stubborn. The O'Brien V.101 Freeman was a two-seater that fired a large 40 millimeter cannon. Although lightly armored, it packed a huge punch and fired the same exact ammo that actual tanks would fire later on in the war. And as ridiculous as it may look just standing still, it gets even weirder since the best way to use this car is to actually drive it in reverse, protecting the engine and giving the gunner just a few more meters of range on the cannon. 
I told Second Lieutenant Stubborn that I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but he said, don't worry, he'd tell me what to do and to just hop in and help out. This is something that I've also seen a lot in Foxhole. Not just the teamwork, but players who quote unquote own vehicles looking for gunners and commanders instead of just making someone drive. Since resources are such a hassle to collect, and then when you add the time it takes to not just build something like an armored car, but then to arm it and then refuel it, players want to make sure it's in good hands. And as important as it is to have a good gunner, it's actually much more important to have a good driver. Knowing when to peek, where to turn, and how to move around a place as cluttered as Saltbrook could mean life or death. And Stubborn was a fantastic crew member. I need you to shoot the ISG, okay? The yeah. The ISG is on the right side, right? Right side. Or the uh, north yeah, yeah, side. Yeah. It's on top of the truck. Yeah. I need, I need, I need to take the body first. Yeah, yeah, no worries. This is going to be, I dude, I want to, I want to take the shot, but I don't want to, you know? Oh, jeez. 77% Where's the, the where's the ISG? Is it on the uh, north, north side? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see it. The ISG, I think I see it on the north side. It's on the bunker, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's about 40 meters away. He's, he just fired. All right, took shot, back up. Got it, got it, got it. Yep, a little closer, we got it. Okay. Okay, they're putting up a cutler. For, uh... Got it. I got the ISG. Thank you. We might be putting up another one. Let the gas pop. Hold on. Yeah, I'm gonna try to go for the tank yet because it keeps peeking it. Oh, just short. He's like 36 meters. Still want me to hit these sandbags? Do you need to drive just a little bit more south? Yeah, right here. These sandbags are chonky. There we go. I, I, I think so. Maybe I got it. Yeah, I think we got it. Thankfully, Second Lieutenant Stubborn was experienced, keeping us out of harm's way and jumping out to repair when needed. Eventually, we RTB'd, and he told me that, unfortunately, he had to go eat dinner, and although he wished we could continue, he was pleasantly surprised at how well I did. I took that as a compliment, then uh, I guess the war never stops, but we've all got to eat, right? I thanked him and moved on to figure out how our boys in the South were doing. After hours of fighting, the South was actually extremely quiet. Friendlies were slowly whittling away the Western defenses, but the inches gained there was actually starting to hurt the overall defense of the city. As ground was gained out west, more people moved off their posts in the east, creating huge gaps that were quickly exploited by the colonials. Although we held Saltbrook proper and the safe houses within the city, Well Church was enemy controlled, and the eastern outskirts had various collie controlled houses and streets. It's actually by complete chance that we ran into the enemy breaking through our lines since I got turned around and began walking east rather than west when trying to meet up with someone. It was here that we ran into a burst of machine gun fire and realized just how fortified this position was. We regrouped and the spuds fanned out and began probing the lines. It appeared that right across this small park was a significant enemy buildup. And without the ability to actually create machine gun emplacements within the city, we needed to secure an area long enough to bring up a construction vehicle and rebuild an entire building called a garrison house. Garrison houses or G houses are structures that act like bunkers. Once built, not only is there AI that will fire upon enemies in range, but you can also actually enter it and fire from inside the second story through various windows. 
A group of spuds and some nearby friendlies worked to hold the enemy off in the park while construction vehicles got to work rebuilding. And soon, we had another fantastic line of defenses keeping the enemy from walking right through the city. With the east now fortified, our south holding, and the majority of our forces working on the west, we soon heard news of a breakthrough. We raced over to the edge of the gates that just hours before was a scene of hundreds and hundreds of dead wardens bravely fighting off the colonials pouring through and jumped into the back of a transport. Fully loaded, we drove straight to the new front, a bunker base just on the outskirts of the old Jack Tar. Freed from the cramped streets, we slammed against the enemy trying desperately to keep us locked in choke points between cliffs, but our numbers were just too great. Another breakthrough and we were able to push straight through north and flank around a huge set of enemy defenses. We followed the river and began peppering their lines with small arms. With gas, RPGs, and another armored car, the enemy defenses quickly fell and we had them completely surrounded and cut off from the relic base down south. We kept up the assault towards Old Jack Tar and with all of the attention focused up north, I took a team to go south and cut off the only Lodgy route that they had left and we even ambushed a group trying to set up a new set of bunker defenses. The fight would last all night and by morning, the Old Jack Tar was firmly in warden hands. After successfully helping our friendly regiments in Endless, it was now time to head back home and reinforce Fort Spud. We began laying concrete, still learning how best to defend ourselves but looking to our nearby regiments for guidance. All was going well, our gains in Tempest were holding, and we were feeling pretty confident. But that didn't last long. Within the day, the Colonials would have artillery, highly mobile wheeled 120mm cannons that rained down shells from up to 250 meters away. I would wake up the next morning with reports that Planifada and Lost Argyll had collapsed at 3am to a massive coordinated infantry and artillery push. The enemy was at our doorstep and once again, we were forced to defend Fort Spud. Or we could be brave and rally our neighbors for a push against a much more coordinated and technologically superior enemy. It was going to be a tough fight, but we knew what we had to do. Is that that's a shell. That's a, we yeah, need back out of here. Keep shooting. Yeah, I still bring this lobby up. Here, it's okay. We can just back out and not take damage because they can't. Even if you do take damage, I've got you. Let's back out. Yo, this they're dialing this in. I hope you guys like this episode of War 83. It's been great to hear from y'all, both Colonial and Warden, in the comments. So if you are enjoying yourselves, please drop this video a like subscribe for more, and do make sure to check out the live streams at twitch.tv slash moidog. These videos have been taking a little bit longer since I have to basically recreate all these maps and graphics for the videos to help explain everything, so I do apologize in the delay, but this next week will be spent on catching us up on videos so that we're closer to the current state of the war, so please do expect plenty more spud action soon. But that's it for me, and until next time, peace.